So today is a special day at Boulder Rotary as we celebrate uh, Black History Month. I hope that everyone's enjoyed your soul food inspired meal today of, of jerk chicken. I'd like to thank the Spice of Life uh, for, for working with us on that. And next I'd like to have Lori Preston come up and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Chad. And thank you all for being here and on Zoom as well. Earlier you met Miss Emily Zinn, the Director of Education of the Museum of Boulder. And I point her out because she was the writer of our recently awarded grant um, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services called Proclaiming Colorado's Black History. The museum's mission is history happens here. The museum showcases inclusive community stories, preserves them for the future, and inspires all of us to effect positive change. But the museum recognizes that it has gaps and needs to ensure that everyone who comes into the museum can see themselves. We have lots of work to do in Boulder, and we have more history to gather. Black history is American history. And as we dedicate this month of February to examine how these histories merge, I'd like to first introduce one of the two speakers we have today, Glinda Strong Robinson. <clears throat> Excuse me, Glinda Strong Robinson. She's a key leader in the project with the museum. She's the founder and president of a finishing touch janitorial services here in Boulder of 25 plus years. She's Secretary of Workforce Boulder County. She's loved by her church members at Second Baptist, where she serves as the Director of Family Care. She is an Executive Committee member and contributor with the NAACP, of which you met with Annette James as President. She's also a co-curator of the NAACP exhibit, which is currently showcased at the Dairy until February 28th. I also want you to know, I think this is pretty unique, she's a communicator and a voice for others, and really like no other in Boulder, at least that I'm aware of. Glenda marched on April 8th, 1968, on behalf of Martin Luther King just when she was 19 years old. She is highly respected and a valued contributor and an influencer in Boulder and beyond. After she speaks will be Adrian Miller. And Adrian, he is a Colorado social historian. He's a graduate of Smoky Hill High School in Aurora, Stanford University, and has his law degree from Georgetown University Law School. Adrian served as Special Assistant to the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. He's also served as the Deputy Legislative Director and Policy Analyst for Colorado Governor Bill Ritter before fully exploring his interest and love in historical food writing. He's the author of three books. One, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time, that won the 2014 James Beard Award, a very significant award in the food industry. He's also who have a second book, and it's called The President's Kitchen Cabinet, and his most recent, Black Smoke, African Americans and the United States of Barbecue. He's a blast to follow on Instagram with his motivational messages and food posts. He serves in a variety of nonprofits. He's on the board of Colorado Humanities, Colorado Public Radio, Artists Against Racism, and that's only a few of several. He's the executive director of the Colorado Council of Churches, and he's the first African-American and lay person to hold that position. And on top of that, and how we are connected, he is the co-project director of our proclaiming project at the museum. He is managing the research and the content direction in collaboration with community partners like Linda that you'll meet today. 
In the words of the Institute of Museum and Library Services director that awarded us this award over the next three years, as pillars of our communities, libraries and museums bring people together by providing important programs, services, and collections. These institutions are trusted spaces where people can learn, explore, and grow. May we do just that today as we meet two very special and and very impactful people in our community. Please join me in welcoming Adrian Miller and now Glinda Strong Robinson. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Wow, what a beautiful afternoon and how delighted I am to celebrate these moments with you. So it's a pleasure for me to be in your midst this afternoon, and I'm glad to share on this occasion. My name is Glenda Strong Robinson. I'm a 41-year resident of Boulder County, living in Longmont. I do serve as the associate minister for the historic Second Baptist Church of Boulder, as well as the historian. We just celebrated 114 years right here in Boulder. I am on the executive committee of the NAACP, the Boulder County branch, where I serve as historian there as well. Been a small business owner in this area for many years. I, the 39, I think it, it's about probably older than I am, but. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to serve on numerous boards and commissions while here. Work, I'll just name a few, Workforce Boulder County Board as a Board of Directors member as well as a mentor, the Family Self-Sufficiency Board and the Project Self-Sufficiency Board and the Boulder County Chamber of Commerce. Currently, I'm serving on the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee. So we're celebrating the announcement of the IMLS grant, and we're thoroughly excited about the fact that the Museum of Boulder has expressed a commitment to proclaiming Col Boulder, Colorado's black history. And once that's done, I certainly pray that it is honored for generations to come. I have twin grandbabies that are five years old. They'll be six, actually, on February 6th. And so, certainly want them to know that right here in Boulder County, we do honor black history. So in honor of Black History Month, I'm excited to share with you that there is an exhibit at the Boulder Dairy Arts Center, initiated by my sister, Madeline Strong Woodley, featuring the Withers Museum and Gallery of Memphis, Tennessee, which is our hometown. Dr. Ernest C. Withers served as the photojournalist and historian of the Civil Rights Movement. Over the years, our families, the Strongs and the Withers families, were closely connected. Among many of the significant images of the exhibit, which is at the Dairy Arts Center, there is a picture of me in the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial March on April 8th, 1968. Folks, that was 54 years ago. Wow. I was also a part of Dr. King's last march on Earth on March 28, 1968, on behalf of the sanitation workers, the garbage workers, known as the I Am A Man March. I hope that many of you here will schedule a tour of the Withers exhibit before they leave town on February 28. The docents are waiting to take you on a tour. The NAACP Boulder County branch, of which our president, Ms. Annette James, is here today, will conclude with its Walk With Me events. 
by presenting the Grammy Award winning Fisk Jubilee Singers from Fisk University, Nashville, Tennessee. They will be at CU Boulder's Mackey Auditorium on February 27th at 2 p.m. You don't wanna miss this exciting, historical, once in a lifetime event. I certainly hope to see you there. Thank you for your time. God bless each of you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Minister Glenda, for those wonderful comments. And um, I'm definitely gonna spread the word about the Fisk Jubilee Singers. That's an incredible um, event that's gonna happen, so thank you. Uh, what I'm gonna do is give you a little bit uh, more of my background. Thank you again, Lori, for that wonderful introduction. And then give you some highlights of what this exhibit is going to do, the kinds of things, the stories we're gonna tell. So um, I'm active on social media. I'm the Soul Food Scholar. My tagline is dropping knowledge like hot biscuits. So certainly gonna do that today. So you can follow me there. Um, and please give a brother some love. Unless you're gonna say something negative, then you can just hold on to that. There's no reason to post that. But here's an example. Um, one thing I always get when I leave Colorado and tell people I'm from Colorado, the question I get is, oh, there are black people in Colorado? Uh, yes, we've been here for a long time. We've done next level things and we've contributed to making Colorado the great state that it is. So this picture is from the early 1900s. It was taken in Denver right along Cherry Creek Drive. And so we have some people dressed up and going cycling, which was a popular thing for people to do in that time. So just a, just a flavor here. Just to go a little bit more in depth about my writing career, um, my first book was on soul food. And just to give you an idea of what kind of research went into these books, I read about 3,500 oral histories of formerly enslaved people looking for all references for food. Um, I read hundreds of cookbooks, uh, hundreds of other books about African American history, uh, talked to hundreds of people about what they thought food traditions were in the black community. Um, read thousands of newspaper articles that are and magazine articles that are now being digitized and um, was fortunate enough to have several of our Colorado black newspapers digitized but this I did this research before the digitization really started happening so I spent a lot of hours in the Denver Public Library going through microfilm looking at every issue and we have black newspapers from the early 1890s in those collections. Uh, and then, because I care so deeply about my research, I decided to eat my way through the country. So, I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities in 15 states. So, if you were my Facebook friend, I brought you along for the journey. I would take a picture of the restaurant and the plate of food and cultivated a community that way. So, um, the soul food book, I originally was gonna write uh, a book about all African American food culture, the cooks, the, the culture surrounding the food and the cuisine itself because so many African American food writers told me there's just not that much information. But because of this newfangled thing called the internet, I was able to get on that and find enough information to write five books. So I decided to write soul food because I thought it was the most recognizable aspect of African American cuisine. So I'm just gonna go through how I organized the book. I just created a representative soul food meal and I wrote a chapter about every part of the meal and explained what it is, how it gets on the soul food plate, what it means for the culture. Now I'm steeped in the black faith tradition, so I'm gonna go through this meal, and as I do it, if you have a reaction, you can say amen, you can applaud, you know, whatever moves you, all right? Entrees, fried chicken, all right. Catfish, chitlins, all right, thank you. <laughs> I know it's not for everyone, for those who don't know, the uninitiated, <laughs> yeah. Chitlins are pig intestines, either stewed or fried, not for everybody. Okay, greens, soul food culture, the popular greens are collard, kale, mustard, turnip, and cabbage. So if you've discovered kale in the last five to 10 years, welcome to the party. We have been eating them for about 300. <laughs> and we got black eyed peas. Yeah. All right, candy jams, which are sweet potatoes. Yeah. All right, macaroni and cheese. All right, then I wrote a chapter about cornbread, chapter about hot sauce, and I wrote a chapter about red drink because I believe red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. <laughs> now you must understand, in soul food culture, red is a color and a flavor, so we don't call things cherry or strawberry, it's just red. There is a generational shift happening. There's a lot of youngins that like purple and blue, and as I wrote in my book, I do believe the children are our future, that we should teach them well and let them lead the way, but not on Kool-Aid because they're messing it up. 
And um, for dessert, I couldn't settle on one, so I wrote about four. Pound cake, peach cobbler, banana pudding, sweet potato pie. So that's the soul food book. And from my research on soul food, I found out that every president of the United States, from George Washington to the president administration, has had an African American cooking for them in some capacity. So this is the collective story, the collective story of those cooks. I was happy to tell that story. Now, I was nominated for a number of awards for this uh, book. I did not win, but I got closer to a lifelong goal. Always wanted to meet Halle Berry. And I was nominated for the NAACP Image Award for Best Work not Literary Nonfiction. And so Halle Berry was one of the presenters. So the progress I made on the goal is that we were in the same building at the same time. <laughs> now, if you go back and look at footage of the ceremony, you will notice that Halle Berry stumbles over her words as she's presenting. That is capturing the moment when our eyes met, even though I was way up in the balcony. <laughs> so just, just pointing that out. And then the third book is Black Smoke, African Americans, United States Barbecue. I wrote this book because I was tired of white dudes getting all the credit. Because if you watch TV shows, read magazine articles, newspapers, movies, all you see is pretty much white dudes doing barbecue. And African Americans have been fundamental and made significant contributions to this culinary genre. So it's telling that story. I, my take on it is that barbecue is Native American in its foundation, and then later Europeans and, and Africans, enslaved Africans, started to fuse their culinary traditions and it became the thing we understand as barbecue today. So that's the book that came out last April and it's doing really well, a lot of fun. All right, so that's the culinary background. Let's talk about proclaiming Colorado's black history. So I'm gonna just quickly give you some glimpses of stories, the kind of stories that we wanna evoke, people that you should know of, communities and other things. So this is, if you've never heard of Lincoln Hills, it's in Gilpin County and it is actually one of the oldest black resorts in the country, particularly west of the Mississippi. So uh, this was uh, started in the 1920s, and this was a place where a lot of African Americans, not only from the Colorado community, but around the country would come to, for recreation. Um, and uh, in fact, Robert Smith, who's now one of the, I think, the wealthiest African American in the world, who might be buying the Broncos, by the way, um, his family used to, still goes to this place and has connections to this Lincoln's Hills Resort. So just something to know about. Uh, Jim Beckworth, uh, may, many of you may know about him. Uh, very monumental figure in early Western history. Um, he shows up in the Colorado area in the 1830s. He was a fur trader, which was very lucrative in the 1830s and 1840s. So he made quite a bit of money that way. Um, and he. Uh, developed a reputation for being a shrewd uh, business person and also uh, for his sense of bravery. Now there's a lot of mythology around this guy so it's going to be, we're going to have to get with some folks to sort out fact from fiction, but we know that he was affiliated with several Native American uh, tribes in the area and supposedly he became chief of a Crow Indian tribe. Um, we'll have to see if that was true or not, but that's, uh, and he had a, a Native American wife. Uh, and he was in Denver in the early years of Denver, in the 1860s or so. There is a story that he got into an altercation with a guy and possibly killed him, we don't know, but this was one bad dude. And there are a lot of uh, markers in the West that are named after him, so mountain passes and other things. So a very interesting guy in Colorado history. Uh, Clara Brown. Clara Brown shows up in the 1870s, formerly enslaved, and she makes her way to what we call now Central City, and she was uh, in the early years a laundress because there were very few professions that African Americans could do without inviting white backlash if they were successful. So doing laundry was one of those few professions. She was very good at it and became quite wealthy doing that, but she didn't hoard all that money for herself. She actually used her money to help others. So she was an early philanthropist in Colorado. If you go to the Colorado Supreme Court in the state capitol today, the old Supreme Court building in the state capitol, you will see her in the stained glass windows uh, towards the ceiling. Uh, Julia Greeley. You may not have heard of Julia Greeley. She was known as the Black Nightingale in Denver in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, but she was a person who was known for helping the poor. So the reason you know, she was called the um, Black Nightingale is that in the evenings she would actually walk the streets of Denver and help the poor and those who were in need. Uh, interesting thing about her is that the, uh, she was of the Catholic faith tradition and the Archdiocese of Denver has now submitted her name to the Vatican to become a saint. 
So she's made it to the second step in the process. A lot of people don't know that, so she's moving up. I think the next thing is they have to have evidence of a miracle. So um, we'll see what that is. But she's going through the process right now. Uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. So we did have Buffalo Soldiers stationed here in Colorado. It was an all black uh, military unit, um, and, and very influential in um, that during the time period of the 1880s, 1890s, even to the early 1900s. Uh, they are called the Buffalo Soldiers. The, the story goes is that uh, Native Americans seeing the hair of these African Americans thought it resembled buffalo wool. And so that's where the nickname Buffalo Soldiers comes from. I could not demonstrate that for you now, obviously, but that's where that comes from. And we're going to also tell the complicated history of Buffalo Soldiers because they were also involved in um, battles with Native Americans. So the, the, con you know, the, the taking of Native American lands, relocating to um, uh, reservations, all of that stuff, that's part of the buff Buffalo, history sol uh, Buffalo Soldier history as well. We're not going to shy away from that. We need to tell that complicated story, but uh, recognized for their valor. In fact, um, some regiments of the Buffalo Soldiers patrolled the West in bicycles. So those old bicycles that had the huge wheel in front, and they were actually, there was an experiment to patrol the West using those, and Buffalo Soldiers were involved in that. Black settlements. So you probably have heard of Deerfield, and I'm going to say a little bit about that in um, a, a moment. But there were a number of uh, black settlements across the state. So these black dots in this image represent places where all black towns were started. Um, none of them ultimately survived to this day, but this is where black towns were started. And one thing is to understand is that um, Colorado was seen as a state of opportunity. Uh, and there was a much higher black population in Colorado than surrounding states. And we're going to explore why was Colorado such a, thought of as such a beacon for opportunity, and we'll explore that story. But we'll, probably the most well-known place is this place called Deerfield. So on the left, you have a flyer. Uh, so what happened is a guy named O.T. Jackson, uh, Oliver Toussaint Jackson, who has bolder ties, uh, started this community, and often there were promotional flyers that were distributed in Denver and other places, encouraging people to come to Deerfield. And the idea was to create an agricultural colony. So it would be a group of, father, of farmers farming this land, and then they would have a, a central point where they could get their goods to market. And so it was an effort to really uh, support this community. Unfortunately, because of the Dust Bowl and other factors, the farming never really gained a strong foothold there. It, it thrived for a, a short time in the 1920s, but by the 1930s, this community was already in decline. And by the time you get to the 1950s, it's pretty much a ghost town. So uh, here's what Deerfield looks like now. There is a move afoot to have this designated as a historic spot, uh, preservation site so that monies can be brought in to rehab these buildings and get them to look like what they looked like in the 1910s and 20s. Business. One of the great business figures we had in our, in our state is Barn Ford, uh, formerly enslaved, escaped from Virginia, makes his way to Chicago. Uh, and uh, eventually goes to Panama where he runs a restaurant for a couple years, but then he ends up in Colorado. And he, when he first got to Colorado, he was in, in the mining business. And in fact, if you go to Breckenridge, his home is now a museum. So he started out in Breckenridge, he actually uh, struck gold, but uh, some jealous white guys around in the area essentially uh, forced him off his land so that they could lay claim to his gold claim. So um, he makes his way to Denver, gets into the restaurant and hotel business. So this is a picture of, of the Inner Ocean Hotel that he ran in downtown Denver. Very stately place and one was, was one of the highest, highest regarded um, hotels in the Rocky Mountain region. And interestingly, when he had this hotel in Denver, he had another replica of this hotel in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So this is a black man in the 1880s running hotels like this, as well as restaurants. Here is the um, current look of an edifice of a restaurant that he used to have. It's in downtown Denver near 15th and Blake. It's currently an Indian restaurant. Um, but that, that middle, the, the kind of mahogany building in the middle, the brick building, that's the edifice of a restaurant that he used to own. And that shows you uh, kind of a newspaper ad that he had in the 1860s for his restaurant, uh, Ford's People. People's Restaurant. 
if you go to the state capitol today and, and then you're in the speaker of the house of representatives above the speaker uh, of the speaker of the house's desk and the podium where they speak you'll see this stained glass window of Bar barney ford so he was very influential figure in territorial and uh, colorado as well as after statehood uh, Madam C.J. Walker, uh, if you don't know his name, she was uh, very famous for her hair care products. She is generally recognized not only to be the first African-American woman to be a millionaire, but the first woman to be a millionaire in this country. And what people don't know is that her early years, she was in the Denver area. Before she goes to Indianapolis and then to New York, she was in Denver and started a lot of her business um, here. And people don't know that connection, so we want to tell that story. Here's an example of an early uh, product label. And this was born from her own experience. She was having uh, trouble growing her own hair and she experimented with different natural remedies and got to one that actually helped stimulate hair growth. And so she's showing the difference and uh, sending that signal to her customers. Entertainment, Hattie McDaniel, uh, the first African-American to win an Oscar. She was a Best Supporting actor, Actress in the movie Gone with the Wind. Uh, she has Colorado ties as well. She was part, the McDaniel family was a family of entertainers. So they were in Kansas, but they would travel all throughout the region. And Hattie was very talented, and so she traveled with the family. They first came to Fort Collins. And this is their house in Fort Collins, which still exists to this day. And they lived there for a short time, but then they eventually moved to Denver. Hattie McDaniel went to East High School and was a performer there. And so she was in high school, but she also did some performing and, and things with the family while uh, she was in high school and afterwards. And then eventually she made her way to California. Law. Um, this is a guy named Joseph Stewart, who was a uh, native of Barbados immigrates to the United States, comes to Colorado, and he was in the Colorado legislature in the 1890s, and one of his signature accomplishments is he essentially got passed the uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act. That was passed in Colorado in 1895 with no opposition. Now, there were several people that weren't feeling it, but they chose to abstain. I don't know why they didn't go on the record, but he got that through in 1895, so we had that on the books. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of the ads that he had in the black newspapers of the day in the early, early 1900s. And um, if you go to 16th and Glenarm today, the Kittredge building, which exists today, there's a restaurant there, but the Paramount um, Theater is right around the corner. There were other lawyers in that, um, black lawyers in that um, office space, and it was considered to be the earliest office space for black lawyers west of the Mississippi. So again, another significant achievement. Uh, this is another attorney named Sam Carey who comes to Colorado. He was originally in Kansas, first practicing law, makes his way to Colorado in the late 1910s, early 1920s, and he is the namesake for the current African American Bar Association, the Sam Carey Bar Association. Um, so even though he was not the very first uh, African American to practice law in this state, he was very significant at a time when the Ku Klux Klan was in power and um, a lot of stuff was happening towards African American. He was seen as a lawyer who would rally to support African American rights. Um, oops, sorry. Medicine, Justina Ford um, was the first African American woman to have a medical license in Colorado and to practice medicine. Um, she was not given medical privileges at any hospitals because of racism, so she had her own private practice. A lot of uh, current people in Denver can trace some ancestor of theirs being birthed by Justina Ford if they were in the Denver area. And her house still exists in Denver today. Um, this is an example of her, an, an ad that she had in the early newspaper. And her former home is now the home of the Black American West Museum which is a great museum, hopefully, uh, I really encourage you to visit that as well. Politics, um, Henry O. Wagner, um, very influential guy who shows up in the 1870s, or sorry, in the 1860s, and he was part of a very important a movement that you may not know of. In the 1860s, Colorado was being considered for a state. Now, for those of you who know, uh, we became a state in 1876. Well, the plan was for Colorado to become a state much earlier than that, but a Wagner organized more than 100 black men to petition Congress to hold up statehood until the Colorado Constitution had a specific provision for black men to vote. And they, they were successful. 
So Colorado becomes a state in 1876 because these black men held that up and then the right to vote was included. Now it wasn't perfect, we needed to include the sisters too, but they got black men the right to vote. And I think that's extraordinary that these men had the influence to do this because they didn't have any leverage. They didn't have any black people in Congress or anything like that, but they were persuasive to the Republicans who were in office at that time. And that's how it got through. And we had a sympathetic governor at that time, but extraordinary accomplishment. Religion. Uh, this is Zion Baptist Church, which is uh, recognized as the oldest African-American church west of the Mississippi, built in 1864. This place is in Denver. It's still a functioning church to this day. And then also, we have to give a shout out to Second Baptist. This is a, formed in 1908. This is a picture from 1946. But I'm so glad that Minister Glenda is part of this project because we want to talk about this, um, the importance of this sacred community to the Boulder story as well as to Colorado history. And then culinary, you know, since I'm a food guy, I gotta talk about culinary history. So uh, in the, these old newspapers uh, from the 1890s and 1880s, um, we find a lot of ads for black restaurants. So this is the earliest ad that I could find besides Barney Ford of a black restaurant in a black newspaper. Uh, this was Mrs. Benjamin's boarding house. And essentially uh, back then, typically you would have some kind of arrangement where you were given lodging and then meals came with that. So it's kind of like getting the free breakfast at Holiday Inn now. You know, we were doing that a long time ago, including other people. I can't claim when we started that idea. But you get the idea um, as an example of a business. Um, here's a look at the menu. Uh, you might have expected soul food items, but you could see that this is pretty typical Americana. Um, you know, I'm, I'm digging the prime rib there, the roast chicken. I don't know about the orange fritters, but macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes, some apple pie, you know, all kinds of good stuff. There's one there, the mountain gold cake. Has anybody ever heard of mountain gold cake? I'm trying to figure, do some research and find that one. Oh, okay. But this is a menu from that time period at the little cottage dining room. Then we've got the Rhine Cafe. Now this is a first class place emphasizing elegance. And so the story here is I want you to not think of soul food as the shorthand for all African American cooking. It really was a, a diversity of cooking. Uh, this is O.T. Jackson, Oliver Toussaint Jackson, who was the spear, uh, the guy who really led the effort for Deerfield. Uh, but he has boulder ties. He actually worked at Chautauqua and um, had a dining room here, uh, the Boulder Cafe. So this is a menu from his dining uh, his restaurant in 1880, in the early 1880s. So uh, he was on the scene. Um, he worked at the Stanley for a short period of time um, before he got into the effort to start up Deerfield. Uh, but one of my favorite stories, and this is in my book, Black Smoke, is I tell the story of Columbus B. Hill, who was from West Tennessee. He shows up in Denver in the late 1870s, and then by the time we get to the 1880s, he's doing barbecues on the regular for thousands of people. 1882, Denver Merchant Barbecue for 5,000. Uh, July 4th, 1890, when the cornerstone ceremony was, um, was held for the state capitol, July 4th, 1890, 25,000 people showed up for a barbecue. Uh, potato, potato, uh, Greeley Potato Days, he was doing barbecues for 11,000 people. Uh, and so this was all documented in our newspapers. Um, so this is from Potato Days, he's kind of in the middle there. I think I could do this. Yeah, he's in the middle here. And there's the pit that they're doing the old school way. So the old, old school way of doing barbecue was to dig a pit in the ground, a uh, few feet deep, a few feet wide, and then you would burn hardwood coals and then put them in the pit. And usually a separate fire was maintained and somebody's job was to just look at the fire, make sure that it was even in heat and then replenish it. And then they would cook whole animals. And it wasn't always pigs. Uh, here, you know, they're doing sheep. But you could do uh, pigs, goats, sheep. If they were doing cows, they, because cows are so big, they would have to quarter them usually. And it was somebody's job to just sit there, look at the meat, const and, um, continuously flip it, and sauce it as it was being cooked. And so he was, you know, it took a lot of administrative skills as well as culinary skills to do this. But my favorite story is from the 1898 uh, stock show. So much like recent history, uh, the stock show was in Denver, but it was uncertain, it had an uncertain future. And so the people behind the stock show said, okay, we're going to have a barbecue for the VIPs and just show them that Denver could put on a really good party and we deserve to continue to have the stock show. So they were going to do a VIP barbecue for 5,000 people. Unfortunately, word got out in lower downtown, which we call Lodo now, and 30,000 people showed up 
up for this barbecue for 5,000 people. So this is an illustration. So this is all people. So Columbus B. Hill and his team are here making the barbecue, but these are, this is the mass of people just kind of watching the spectacle and waiting for that food. Here's a look at the menu, okay? So you've got beef, buffalo, possum, bear, mutton, elk, antelope, lamb, all, and that's just a, just a little slice of what they were had on the menu. So uh, you've got this crowd, they're smelling all this good barbecue, and the organizers realize they have quite a problem because there's no way they can feed everybody. So somebody got the bright idea, it's like, okay, why don't we just give out free beer from the Zhang Brewery, maybe that'll chill people out. Okay, you understand how this story ends. Essentially, there's a big barbecue riot. And here's an example, here's a look at it. Someone sketched it. So you got all these people, that, a train excursion, a train brought people to the venue, the VIPs, but then a riot broke out. People just bum rushed the whole scene, this, you know, grabbing food where they could. The governor of Colorado and the mayor of Denver got on a platform to try with a bullhorn to try to chill people out. People started throwing food at them, so they had to run and escape. It was just a bad scene. And the thing that I love about this, in all of this chaos, there's a guy serenely eating his barbecue sandwich, right? I just love that. So um, it, this, this hurt Columbus B. Hill's reputation for a little while, he took a lot of the blame for the barbecue, um, which I think is unfair, but his, re his reputation did rebound. And the last barbecue that he did was in 1908. He was put on a train to Seattle, Washington to do a barbecue for the Pacific Fleet. Um, so um, I recently discovered his unmarked grave at Riverside Cemetery in Denver. Uh, I discovered it a few years ago, and so pre-pandemic, I was actually raising money so we could have a proper burial and have a headstone for him, but the pandemic hit, so I delayed that. But the 100th uh, anniversary of his death, it will be in 2023, so I'm thinking of waiting for the day that he was interned in 2023 and having a ceremony and just recognizing this great man of barbecue in the West. So um, I hope you, that's just a taste, to use a culinary term, of the kind of storytelling we're going to do. And I'm going to be working with people like Minister Glinda and Annette and others to try to figure out how to tell these stories in a compelling way rooted in the Boulder community. One thing that you should know is that this exhibit will talk about all of Colorado. And our hope, our prayer, is that once this exhibit which opens in September of 2023 and runs for a year. Once that's completed, that other communities will be compelled to bring it to their community and that it will travel around and communities will put their own local spin on it when it's in their, in their place. So thank you for your time. I would love to just answer your questions. Well, it was an incredible talk and we learned an incredible amount. I just want to say that uh, today we stand on the shoulders of pioneer civil rights leaders like Glenda Robinson, and it, it's incredibly meaningful to have you here. And then Adrian, you're carrying it forward, a, a vibrant culture with depth and breadth. And we have to ask the question, why isn't it known? And the answer is clear. There's systemic racism that runs through this country that's been a stain on us as a country, and it's time we move beyond it. And I appreciate that you're helping us to do that. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So if we don't remember our history, with this discrimination is gonna resurface, and it's resurfacing often today. Mm -hmm. So in honor of your talk, uh, we at Rotary have been working for 40 years to try to eradicate polio. And we're very, very close, as we like to say. And we are, uh, less than 100 cases. Um, and in your honor, we want to give 100 doses of polio vaccine to the Polio Plus Foundation. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>